Hi, I'm Rashonda Kaye. This is Reading with Rashonda. We are still reading William Wells Brown's Clotel, and we I went off on a rant about education when we stopped in chapter 21 last time, so we're going to finish chapter 21 this time. All right. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Get as much education as possible for yourselves and your children, and ignorant people can never occupy any other than a degraded station in society. They can never be truly free until they are intelligent. In a few days, you will start for the state of Ohio, where land will be purchased for some of you who have families, and where I hope you will all prosper. We have been urged to send you to Liberia, but we think it wrong to send you from your native land. I love that, right? So, okay, there's a colony of former slaves in Liberia, people who had never been to Africa. Their native land was the U.S. Why are we kicking them out? We did not wish to encourage the colonization society, for it originated in hatred of the free colored people. Its pretenses are false, its doctrines odious, its means contemptible. Now, whatever may be your situation in life, remember those in bonds is bound with them. You must get ready as soon as you can for your journey to the north. So I should have prefaced this, but this is Georgiana's on her deathbed. She's setting her slaves free and she's giving them some instructions for what they should do in their freedom and with their freedom. Seldom was there ever witnessed a more touching scene than this. There sat the liberator, pale, feeble, emaciated, with death stamped upon her countenance, surrounded by the sons and daughters of Africa, some of whom had in former years been separated from all that they held, had held dear, near and dear, and the most of whose backs had been torn and gashed by the Negro whip. Some were upon their knees at the feet of their benefactress. Others were standing round her weeping. Many begged that they might be permitted to remain on the farm and work for wages, for some had wives and some husbands on other plantations in the neighborhood and would rather remain with them. And what a fact of slavery that you marry and your spouse is sent away somewhere. If you're fortunate, your spouse is sent away somewhere close by. If you're not, they're like, get over it. Get you a new spouse. Eh. But the laws of the state forbade any emancipated Negroes remaining under penalty of again being sold into slavery. I am going to free you. I get you want to stay here with your family, but the laws of the land forbid it. So we're really here at a tension between what is just and what is right. Hence the necessity of sending them out of the state. Mrs. Carleton was urged by her friends to send the emancipated Negroes to Africa. Extracts from the speeches of Henry Clay and other distinguished colonization society men were read to her to induce her to adopt this course. Some thought they should be sent away because the blacks are vicious. Others because they would be missionaries to their brethren in Africa. But, said she... If we, send an, if we send away the Negroes because they are profligate and vicious, what sort of missionaries will they make? And that's a great question. Your reasoning is flawed, sir and ma'am. Why not send away the vicious among the whites for the same reason and the same purpose? Ooh! Death is a leveler and neither age, sex, wealth, nor usefulness can avert when he is permitted to strike. The most beautiful flowers soon fade and droop and die. This is also the case with man. His days are uncertain as the passing breeze. This hour he glows in the blush of health and vigor, but the next he may be counted with the number no more known on earth. Although in a low state of health, Mrs. Carleton had the pleasure of seeing all her slaves, except Sam and three others, start for a land of freedom. The morning they were to go on board the steamer bound for Louisville, they all assembled on the large grass plots in front of the drawing room window and wept while they bid their mistress farewell. I have to wonder, what are they weeping about? Are they weeping because they're so sad they're leaving their mistress? Are they weeping because they are so happy they have gained their freedom? Are they weeping for something different? And I really wonder what did the audience of this book assume? that they were weeping about. I assumed that the audience assumes 
that they were weeping about something that resonated with them, right? Like if they were a white slaveholding audience, of course these emancipated slaves are weeping because they're leaving their home and leaving the great institution of slavery. So I'm always fascinated by how audi what audiences bring to the works that we're reading. I've been ranting, let me keep reading. When they were on the boat about leaving the wharf, they were heard giving the charge to those on shore. Sam, take care of Mrs. Take care of Master, as you love us and hope to meet us in Ohio, Ohio, and in heaven. Be sure and take good care of Mrs. and Master. In less than a week after he, her emancipated people had started for Ohio, Mrs. Carlton was cold in death. Mr. Carlton felt deeply, as all husbands must who love their wives, Oh, that's a dig, right, to Clotel's husband. Ooh, all husbands. Mr. Carlton felt deeply, as all husbands must, who love their wives. Oh, but Clotel's husband couldn't have really loved her if he did what he did. Mm, scoundrel. All right. Mr. Carlton felt deeply, as all husbands must, who love their wives, the loss of her who had been a lamp to his feet and a light to his path. So clearly um, she's Jesus and God's word because God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. Interesting correlation. Um, Jesus is the one who sets everybody free and apparently Georgiana Carlton is a savior. She had converted him from infidelity to Christianity, from the mere theory of liberty to practical freedom. He had looked upon the Negro as an ill-treated distant link of the human family. He now regarded them as a part of God's children. Oh, what a silence pervaded the house when the Christian had been removed. His indeed was a lonesome position. Twas midnight and he sat alone, the husband of the dead. That day the dark dust had been thrown upon the buried head. In the midst of buoyancy of youth, this cherished one had drooped and died. Deep were the sounds of grief and mourning heard in that stately dwelling when the stricken friends, whose office it had been to nurse and soothe the weary sufferer, beheld her pale and motionless in the sleep of death. Oh, what a chill creeps through the breaking heart when we look upon the insensible form and feel that it no longer contains the spirit we so dearly loved. How difficult to realize that the eye which always glowed with affection and intelligence, that ear which had so often listened to the sounds of sorrow and gladness, that the voice whose accents had been to us like sweet music, and the heart the habitation of benevolence and truth, are now powerless and insensate as the beer upon which the form rests. Though faith be strong enough to penetrate the cloud of gloom which hovers near, and to behold the freed spirit safe forever, safe in its home in heaven, yet the thoughts will linger sadly and cheerlessly upon the grave. Peace to her ashes, she fought the fight, obtained the Christian's victory, and wears the crown. But if it were that departed spirits are permitted to note the occurrences of this world, with what a frown of disapprobation would hers view the effort being made in the United States to retard the work of emancipation for which she labored and so wished to see brought about? In what light would she consider that hypocritical priesthood who gave their aid and sanction to the infamous fugitive slave law? If true greatness consists in doing good to mankind, then was Georgiana Carlton an ornament to human nature? Who can think of the broken hearts made whole, of sad and dejected countenances now beaming with contentment and joy, of the mother offering her free-born babe to heaven, and of the father whose cup of joy seems overflowing in the presence of his family, where none can molest or make him afraid? Oh, that God may give more such persons to take the whip-scarred negro by the hand and raise him to a level with our common humanity. May the professed lovers of freedom in the new world see that true liberty is freedom for all. Let me read that again. May the professed lovers of freedom in the new world see that true liberty is freedom for all. And may every American continually hear it sounding in his ear. Okay, so what came into my head was free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. But since Dr. King hadn't been born yet, we know that that's not the next line. So let me reread. 
May the professed lovers of freedom in the new world see that true liberty is freedom for all, and may every American continually hear it sounding in his ear. Shall every flap of England's flag proclaim that all around are free, from farthest end to each blue crag that beetles o'er the western sea? And shall we scoff at Europe's kings when freedom's fire is dim with us, and round our country's altar clings the damning shade of slavery's curse? Basically, how can we say we're a free country when we hold such a large portion of the population in slavery? And that ends chapter 21 of Clotel. We'll go ahead and stop there. Thanks for joining me. I'm Rashonda Cade. This is Reading with Rashonda.